Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Okay. You lock the car, right? Throw it. Welcome again to this segment of the Oregon Voters Digest. I'm Bruce Broussard. As you can see, I'm, I'm holding this piece here, Behind the Badge in River City, a Portland Police Memoir. Last week, you know, we, we, we talked about this with, uh, with Don DuPay, who, who happens to be the publisher of this particular publication. He's a local Portland policeman, well, former local po Portland policeman, and uh, it was quite a chat. And the whole idea, if you will, was to educate the public, the public, the people who are in charge, if you will, of, uh, of the city of Portland and the voting public, if you will. And we, we've had these issues about um, where do we go with, with, with law enforcement? And it was very difficult, in all due respect, very difficult to get the present Portland police individuals to come on the show to talk about this whole issue. And, uh, mm -hmm. and also, in all due respect, also the mayor and some of his folks. And, you know, and my point is that we've got to come with a solution to this point. We do need public safety and the whole issue of the criminal justice system. It's a big issue aspect of it. And so as a result of that, we felt we need to spend some time. And we are fortunate, in all due respect, to, to have Don Dupay, who, picked a, who basically took his time and put this publication together, uh, Behind the Badge in River City, a Portland Police Memoir. And if you want to see um, the, the, the last show, you can go on YouTube and pick it up on Oregon Voters Digest. But today what we're going to be doing is that we're going to co complete the interview with Don uh, and he's got a few questions that he that, that I'm going to be asking him to him to follow up on this piece about this particular book, and then after that, Fred's going to be on. You've seen Fred before. Fred's also been the co-host on many occasions over here on on our show here, and uh, I'm going to ask him for comments. We're going to be talking about comments, and then we're just going to have a discussion because at the end of the day, we want to find a couple of things. One, who's responsible? Who should be responsible? Bottom line, and how do we how do we get to the point where we can talk about respecting law enforcement? And that whole that, that whole situation, and get i.e. the public involved in this process, mm -hmm. and that's what we are. So with that, Don, welcome again. Thank you. Sounds I'm happy great. to be here so, again. Sounds great. And hey, Fred, thanks for being being with us. I see you're donning the your your, your other part of the deal, right? USMC, yeah. right? And again, to those vets, and also Don, by the way, is also happens to be a former Navy person. They provide our yep. checks. We appreciate it. Paymaster. That. Yeah. That's right. Good deal. Good deal. Okay. So on that, Don, let's get right into into, into the into the behind the badge in River City and the point of where we left off at. Let, let's get right into some of those questions. I'll hold the book. Okay. Well, let's preface it by saying that I'm one of the probably two or three officers still alive wow. that actually worked the streets uh, of Albina in the 1960s and uh, worked at the 1967 riot that started up in the park on Fremont Street. Yeah. So that's my background. I was there. I did it. Uh, I know what happened, and a lot of it, most of it is in the book, mm -hmm. and uh, whether you like it or not, it's a true story. So it's a history book in a lot of ways, and it's also a rule book. If you can say it, uh, I would say it's a text mm -hmm. on how to do some of the things, police work. It's a text on uh, the history of the, of the area, and so that's how I present it. And talked about police work during that particular time. Absolutely. Yeah. And 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 the, and, the, and the difference, if you will, and presently how we, how they do police work mm -hmm. and in the past. And I think yeah, that's a yeah. that's a good idea. Okay. Yeah. Sounds yeah. great. Okay. Now let's get right to in those questions, if you will. Okay. Uh, you, you, what what contributes most to the b a burnout of a long time cop? The horror. You, the horror. The horror. Yeah. You know, what, what does that mean? That means that on a daily basis. You see somebody with their head shot off. Uh, you see a suicide with uh, a guy sticks a shotgun in his mouth and blows his head all over the room. Wow. Uh, you see traffic accidents where people are dead all over the street. Uh, in the 1960s, when I worked traffic, uh, I worked traffic alone, and uh, I had. Uh, one triple fatal, where you have three dead bodies in one car. So that's, uh, that's like bang, bang, bang. So there's some horror in just working traffic. You know, a lot of accidents. I had another accident at uh, Interstate Street in Killingsworth, where two cars came together at about 80 miles an hour. They both ran the red light. Mm -hmm. They didn't know each other was there. Mm -hmm. And the whole just, everything just blew up. Mm -hmm. Body parts, 
car parts, that kind of stuff mm -hmm. is, uh, and the daily, uh, the daily seeing bad guys doing mm -hmm. bad things and you put them in jail and they come back mm -hmm. and you put them in jail and you come back so you get that sense of what that. the hell am i doing mm -hmm. you know so so how do that's so, the burnout okay, is so, that 20, so me, oh. 15 or years or so okay. of the same old same old same okay. old that never gets better so tell me a couple of things one how do you deal with it as an individual does the cop deal with an individual and how does the department respond to reacting to, to solving it getting you back on so you can get back on the beat there was no, there was no uh, available counseling in the 1960s and 70s. They didn't have that. If you had uh, someone you needed to talk to, you went and talked to Ed Stell, the chaplain. He was the only available person to talk to. Uh, your sergeant, your captain, suck it up, hmm. suck it up. And uh, the way a lot of policemen, including myself, dealt with it was two hours at the police club drinking drinking it off because it's hard to understand that so many guys they go to work in an office they put on their tie they do their work they come home they open a newspaper mm -hmm. they sit down and put their feet up and they read the paper how was your day at the office honey oh it was good it was good but when you're a policeman you get three or four s terrible situations like that you see a murder, you see somebody blown all to hell. And how do you deal with that? When you go home, you don't just, oh, honey, it was a nice day. I, I sit up and read the paper. No, you pour a glass full of whiskey and hope you can go to sleep and get that, get that rerunning video out of your mind. So it's completely different. And how do you deal with it? Alcohol, counseling, if you can get it. They don't have counseling in those days. Okay. Good old Ed Stell. Wow. Okay. He's a wonderful man. Let's give it another one. How could officers have been better supported in your time so that burnout did not become an issue? We talked a little bit about that. Anything you want to add to that? Well, burnout is always going to be an issue, but they need to have uh, professional psychological counseling. They need to have somebody that you can go talk to, somebody that's may have been there, mm -hmm. somebody that's been on the street, or somebody that understands what it's like. Uh, they have they don't have any of that available i think they do now and i hope so because if you don't get it out of you it stays in you and when it stays in you it will drive you crazy mm -hmm. contribute to the escalating pstd over the years to where it really messes you up like it messed me up you know i was gonna, i was going to ask you about you nancy uh, even in the service i'm sure we're, we're familiar with the fact of going to the chaplain if you will yeah but in this particular case why not a professional uh, a professional psych person if you will mm -hmm. someone that, that's basically supposed to respond to those kinds of issues they didn't see the necessity of it hmm. it wasn't in the budget uh, the chaplain was in the budget, but that's all. There was there was nothing in the budget. Once you got past the psychiatric evaluation and joined the police department, that was the last time you saw the psych. That's the last time you saw the psych, the shrink. Yeah. Wow, wow, okay. And that's too bad. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. And I want Fred. Mm -hmm. I want Fred to listen. With what do you consider your greatest contribution from all your years of law enforcement service? Well, this may surprise you, but. My greatest contribution was saving the Jacob Cam House. The Jacob Cam House. Jacob Cam House. That's spelled K-A-M-M. -M. It's an old house that sits on 20th Street now, uh, right next to where Goose Hollow is. Okay. And in the 70s, uh, it was a derelict... That's Southwest. Southwest. It was a derelict house uh, sitting there waiting for... Uh, waiting for... to get on the organ or the historical register mm -hmm. so they could do something with it and fix mm -hmm. it up. In the meantime, uh, probably two or three times a week, someone was breaking into the house. They'd come in and they'd steal something or they'd start a little fire to keep warm. Mm -hmm. So the place was in danger of being destroyed. Mm -hmm. What I did was, at that time I was a detective and I worked uh, alarms. I put in silent alarms. So I went up there and I put a silent alarm. There's a nice, beautiful, ornate stairway coming down from upstairs. And underneath, at the foot of the stairs, there's a little piece of carpet. And on that little piece of carpet, I put a pressure pad. So if you stepped on that carpet, the silent alarm went off. Mm -hmm. So in the two plus years that we had that alarm in there, we caught 35 or so people 
Some of them were just kids looking for uh, a good time, looking around, snooping, had no intention of doing any harm, and we arrested them for trespassing. There were those that came in to steal the ornate light fixtures, pry up a piece of marble, uh, tear down a piece of old uh, molding. So those people we arrested for burglary. Mm -hmm. But if that alarm had not been in there, the Jacob Cam house would not exist. Does it exist today? It's still there today. Wow. It's beautiful. You wow. should go see it. It's wow. on 20th just off of Jefferson. And who occupies it now? It's an office building occupied by, I think, some attorneys. There's a French uh, school there. So it's, it's divided into several offices. Wow. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. place. Beautiful place. Okay. Jacob Cam was one of the original really? uh, hmm. uh, pioneers in this town. You know, I saw this article in the paper about um, this Samayan that was just, uh, uh, I guess, uh, basically graduated. Well, they, but, well, he's admitted to the police department, so he hasn't gone through training yet. But there was Somali. There was a big thing about the Somali, the Somali officer you know, yeah. representing the, mm -hmm. the, the, the i.e., his people. And I was, yeah. I was, that was something I had a little concern about there from mm -hmm. the standpoint of him just being a cop. You mm -hmm. got me? Mm -hmm. So I, that's the only this other question that I have for you, Kimmy. Do you think we need more police of color? Well, absolutely, we need more police of color because the policemen should look more like the people that they police. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. okay. Otherwise, you got the we they. Too much we they going on. Mm -hmm. If you're working in a in a in an, uh, an ethnically diverse neighborhood, you should have ethnically diverse policemen. Mm -hmm. Now, the Somali officer, that's just great. I'm happy that they were able to find a college-educated fellow that was interested in police work mm -hmm. and naive enough to get involved in it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, absolutely, the more black officers they have, I think that the better the Portland police would be because there's too much of that we they. Mm -hmm. There's too much that way there. Mm -hmm. I heard somewhere the other day it says you don't, uh, you don't count until you've been killed by a white cop. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that's the kind of nonsense that mm -hmm. we need to mm -hmm. put an end to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need we need more diverse policemen. Okay, okay, absolutely. Now, on, on that, in fact, on that on that same that same note with reference to a police of mm -hmm. color, where should they be assigned? Or should they just be a cop who happened to be a person of color, or should they should they be assigned, i.e., to that specific culture? What's your, what's well, your I think I think they should be assigned to that specific culture, but there's some difficulties with that. Uh, I talked about that with my wife Teresa. Uh, is this Somali officer going to be just available to the Somali community? Yeah, right. I don't think so. He's going to be assigned a district, and he's going to be working probably in Selwood for a while. You know where. Uh, there are probably not very many Somalis, but there is a large Somali community here in Oregon, in Portland, mm -hmm. and they absolutely need a Somali police officer or two or three or six. But just saying I'm going to have a Somali police officer do the Somali problem, that's like saying I got a Mexican cop and yeah, he's just going right, to work the Mexican right, district. Right, right, you know, I right. got a guy that's just going to work downtown right, right, in Skid Row. Right, right. That's, that's not the way. Well, that's what I got out of the article, you know, yeah. as if to say, well, these people are saying, now we've got a Somali officer yeah, yeah. and he's going to be just for us kind of a routine. And I think that that's what I don't think, I think that's realistic. Okay, good. And, and, and I won't afraid to comment on this after mm -hmm. we get through this. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on the new, well, we talked about the Somali uh, police officer aspect mm -hmm. of it. Any other, uh, any other little specifics you want to get into before we get into it with Fred? We're going to be doing some more, more of this, by the way, in, in the future. But any other little points you might want to make? Well, we should talk about affirmative action. Affirmative action. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about that. Affirmative action, in my opinion, has always been a double-edged sword mm -hmm. because the good part of it is, is it allowed uh, and encouraged the hiring of more officers of color. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are officers on the police department today that benefited from that. The bad part was it stopped the height requirements. Mm -hmm. It used to be when I was a cop, you had to be five foot eight. Now I think you can be as small as five foot two. Mm -hmm. And that, unfortunately, feeds into the Napoleonic syndrome, the short man syndrome. And the shorter the man, you know, the more he has to be in authority. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then, if you give this five foot two, five foot three guy, who already has a problem, being a man, and give him a uniform and a badge and a gun, then you have effectively created a tyrant. Mm -hmm. And uh, right today, uh, Bruce, right here in McKinney, Texas, there's a video that happened today of a 
of, a, of an officer, a white officer, that looks to be in the video about five foot four, five foot five. Mm -hmm. He's too short to do the job, and he uh, is called to uh, a pool party where there are a whole bunch of teenagers uh, just having fun, making noise, and he gets all excited. He jumps out of the car. By himself. He's by, by himself. Well, he's by himself initially. Yeah, he's by himself initially. And he runs around acting like a short guy. Hmm. You know, he's shorter than the teenagers that he's trying to get under control. Mm -hmm. And what he does was he picks the smallest, weakest person there, which mm -hmm. happened to be a 14-year-old black girl who mm -hmm. had on a bikini, and he throws her to the ground, puts his knees on her back, he gets excited, he pulls his gun. Now he's out there with a gun, and he's waving it around for no reason. I mean, he hasn't been threatened. So he puts his gun back after he realizes he made a mistake. And then he realizes he's been photographed, and someone says, you pulled your gun out. He says, no, I didn't. <laughs> so he's lying, and he's overreacting, and he's a typical example of what I, re what I refer to as the short syndrome should never have been a policeman. And, and they would not have known that without a smartphone. No. <laughs> How uh, do these guys get uh, past the shrink? Uh, How do they get past the psychiatrist? That's uh, what I continues to bother me. How so many guys get in trouble because the shrink didn't figure them out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I joined the police department in 1961, uh, there were 18 of us that went to the academy. We all went through the same shrink. One of the officers worked after about three years, was arrested and went to prison for rape. Hmm. I know four policemen that got in trouble for being sexually inappropriate. Uh, this one went to prison. Uh, I think another one, then the other three were all assigned at North Precinct where they kind of dumped everybody in those days. And I think he went to prison too for being inappropriate with a young girl. But anyway, so there was four of them that got past the shrink. And there's too many of them today. I don't know how you stop it. I don't know. But you see it on TV, you see this on YouTube. What are these guys doing? Mm -hmm. How did they get to be a cop mm -hmm. in the first place? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the other thing I was going to ask you along that same line in regards to the recruitment aspect of it, normally it's, it's, it's identified as a paramilitary kind of a situation. And a lot of times the, the department tends to go after folk, former, former military sure. type folks. And especially during these particular times, we're talking about PTSD. And that's, that makes a statement from the standpoint you do have a sort of an injury. You never know when you're going to do this, this, that, and the other. Mm -hmm. But there's, but there, again, how many of these, those kinds of individuals do they tend to try to attract to be on? How many are, are on the force, do you think? And should I, they if, be on the force? If, if you have PTSD, right. I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be a policeman. Right, okay. But if you are a policeman, you're going to get PTSD. So okay. if you got it to start with, okay. you're going to you're gonna have a bad case of it in a few okay. years. Okay, so you say a few years, right? A so few now, years, yeah. now they've gone through yeah. this few years, they got PTSD. Yeah. Should we keep them? Should they stick around? Well, there we go back to my initial... You used to talk about the 15 years. The 15 years. Talk about you it. should You should be able to retire from the police department after 15 years because after 15 years, you're so disgusted, you're so burnt out, you're useless anymore. You know, I don't care anymore. I want my paycheck, I want my vacation. I don't care what happens to you. Get them out because they've earned it. Mm -hmm. They've earned it. And that's what, get them out after 15 years, give them a decent pension, right. let them go. Right. Get them out of your hair right. because right. they're not helping you anymore. Right. They're helping themselves. Good. Fred, let, let's get Fred in the conversation. Now we're going to have a good discussion here. And if you guys man, don't mind, we're just going to go on str straight through the hour, so we can just go on and keep it very simple for everybody, for that matter. Fred, you know, I guess the, the, see, from a local standpoint, remember the 17-year-old kid that uh, that shot uh, in this crowd at this art festival aspect of it? 16. Six, it was 16 years old. 16. Okay. One, what was your impression when you got in? Because, you, you know, you've been out there. You, you, you've, uh, I've seen your Facebook comments. I mean, you've been very involved. And it, and it, it really takes a lot, out of, a, a lot of respect for you from the standpoint. You're a business person in your own right. You're, you're trying to eat. And, you know, you're making a living. But you're going to spend your time, if you will, 
to respond to some of the issues that are really of major concern, not only to that community, but but the entire Portland community, the country for that matter. And we want to thank you very much for, for the efforts that you've made along that particular line. So getting back to that particular point, one, how did you react to that? And then after that, then I'd like for you to start talking about how, how are you reacting to the issues today on this whole business of police? Well, about the shooting, Yes. I, you know, I live over in Piedmont, over in Northeast Mallory. I grew up in this neighborhood, so, plus I sold, you know, 738 homes right. in this neighborhood, or addresses, about 1,000 transactions. So there's a lot of people in the inner north and northeast Portland that I know, a lot. My first thought was I hope nobody I know got hurt, mm -hmm. and I hope nobody I, I know's kid got hurt. Yeah. That's the first thing. <clears throat> But the next thing was, I've been telling all of my friends on Facebook and everywhere else, we're, this is going to happen. We're going to see shootings by gang members at the places all of us Portland people like to go because we don't have a centralized place where black people live anymore like the days when Don was a, a Portland police officer. Mm -hmm. Black people live everywhere, and we go everywhere. And gangbangers, they murder black people. And they don't care who's between them or behind us. They will just shoot us. And we're going to see a day where white people, especially young white people, um, are going to be killed, are going to be murdered in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. um, there's nothing stopping them uh, because of efforts from people like Don't Shoot Portland, uh, what I call the political wing of the Portland bla black gang, gang culture, uh, and others. Yeah. You know, <laughs> cops in Portland are hesitant. They're not tracking up and close and personal like historically um, police officers do with people that they feel are threats. And we've got a, a, a younger crew, a young crew of black gang members who really feel that the streets belong to them. And you can see that by, I think we're close to 70 shootings, 25 murders, uh, 23 of them black people. Um, Right now, if you go back to August of 1988, when Ray Ray Winston, the first official mm. uh, gang member, was murdered in this town, if you count the um, uh, uh, open cases, the, the cold cases, we're now at about 550 dead black young people hmm. in Portland. Now, the fascinating thing is we've got less than 40,000 black people in the entire market of Portland. In the city of Portland, we may have as few as 20,000 black people. So that means over the last 20 years, uh, what is it, 10 times higher rate of our young people have been murdered? Well, now we're going to see these black murderers, black gang members, shooting people in Alberta. We just saw that. It's going to happen on Hawthorne. It's going to happen on Division. It's going to happen on Mississippi. It's going to happen on North Williams going to happen more often in downtown Portland. Okay, you okay. got I want to ask you a question. It's going to happen at PSU. And it's going to happen. I, and I, you know, I actually, I'm surprised it hasn't happened a lot yeah. already, yeah. At, mm -hmm. at, you know, at PSU. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's talk about that, Pete. Now, one, one, one of the things that this, this business of gang members came up all of a sudden, mm -hmm. and, and right off the bat, it identified with black folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Let's talk about the impact this had. What, what's your well, definition of gang member? What, well, where did we start this gang member? We've thing? had gangs throughout the history of Portland. Well, the history of this country. Oh, well, no, but I'm ta <laughs> we're talking about Portland. What's unique right now is we've never had gangs that are this violent. Okay? You're talking we, about blacks, right? Well, the black gangs make all the other gangs look friendly. Okay, so there are the other gangs. <laughs> you know? No, there are the other gangs. There are. <laughs> like what? Well, there's Hispanic gangs, there's okay. Asian gangs, of course, there's the biker gangs. Yeah. I mean, white gangs. White gangs. Regular, when I grew up in Portland here in the 1970s, yes, anybody who grew up in the 1970s, we had the Gypsy Jokers riding her right, here. Right, right, in Northeast Portland. For some reason, they didn't yeah. murder white people like this. You know, we didn't have the Gypsy Jokers running down Alberta Street going, there's a white guy I don't like, <laughs> I'm going to shoot him. We didn't have Gypsy Jokers going to funerals, uh, churches, and high schools because they felt like we're murdering white how, people. How did we get there? How did we get to that particular point? Because, when did it start? Because the, 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 the bad black families, and that's where all these gang members come from, they come from the same old families. If the media would ever do a, a family tree, they will find some of these families were bad 50 and 60 years ago. They weren't as bad because between uh, the Portland police 
and between people who lived inside the black community, they knew their days were not long on this earth if they but crossed the line. There were just a few people, though. At that point well, time. no, yeah, but they had kids. They have sex, you yeah, know, and yeah. they they make babies, oh, and they tra and they That's train their babies to be just as violent as them. But the difference is, this gr group for the last thirty years, they've had the less pressure put on them to not be a threat to the community. And that's what people like people like me, when we saw these gang members uh, marching um, uh, 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 for Don't Shoot Portland mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, for a shooting that happened in Ferguson, Missouri. I'm not talking about shooting here. They were protesting against Portland cops for something that happened over, what, 15, 1,800 miles away? And, uh, I mean, and then last week we find out that the kid that, mur uh, that tried to murder people on Alberta Street what does his grandmother do for a living? She is one of these people trying to control gangs. Well, what did her son do? What did this guy's grandfather do? Mm -hmm. You know, paternal grandfather, I should say, or maternal grandfather. No, paternal grandfather. I mean, we're talking generations of threats to the black community. And since black lives don't matter, when a black person takes it, it's going unchecked right now. And right now, uh, because of Don't Shoot Portland and other people that lead those type of things right now, black gang members now have a political wing. And they are now mm -hmm. telling mm -hmm. our mayor, hey, if you shoot one of us, if you hurt our feelings, if you make us feel uncomfortable, wait, 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 wait. we're going to call wait, you wait, wait, racist. Wait a minute, let's define, <laughs> wait, no, no, let, let's define it. You, you say a political wing. What are you talking about and who are you talking well, about? Well, I'm talking about Don't Shoot Portland. I mean, Don't Shoot Portland... Uh, admit, I mean, their leaders admitted on my Facebook that they hang out with gangs. A couple of them said they were in gangs. It was none of my business. I mean, it's, I mean, they were that bold mm -hmm. to come out and just say, yeah, I hang out with gangs. I was literally sitting there and watching the children of gang members that I grew up with marching. And then we'd have some white reporter from Channel 6 or Channel 8 mm -hmm. put a mic in front of them mm -hmm. and say, how do you feel about the Portland yeah, police? Right. I mean, I was like, gosh, this is hilarious. They're putting a mic in front of a gang member or a gang member's fine. mother mm. and say, how do you feel about the cops? Mm. Do you really expect a gang member to say they love cops? <laughs> you know, do you really expect a gang member to say, mm -hmm. I want to have a better relationship with the mm -hmm. Portland police? Mm -hmm. No, they're not going to say that. Mm -hmm. And they never say, well, you know, the reason why the cops jacked me up is I'm under suspicion for two or three shootings. And they're following me because mm -hmm. they're trying to put me in jail for being a murderer. That's the profiling piece. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, but the thing is, the cops have a, in Portland have a very extensive intelligence part. Yeah, right. And they do this thing called investigations. And there are people that they feel pretty confident you killed somebody or you're about to. And what the, the gang culture in, in Portland is trying to do, with the help of white people who are just letting it happen, is put a wedge between what a cop can do and mm -hmm. what a cop can't mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. You understand to mm -hmm. keep an eye on them. You know, it's a it's a vicious it's a vicious circle. Well, well you know, this is why we're doing this show, Fred. The idea is that we've got to educate the public. You know, the majority of the people and black people here in the Portland city are not like that, mm -hmm. but they're being identified as so we all look alike. Well, it's, it's a little bit of that. I mean, we got a lot of white people, a, a ton, probably more than Portland's ever had, that really want to find a way to yes. make things better. That's, what we talk, that's why but, Don did his book. But yeah, That's why Don did his book, which I tell you, is, is I always tell people this is a gift to Portland. Oh, yeah. Oh, because yeah. a lot of the bad habits our cops do have, mm -hmm. he articulates them and in And that's here. a small percentage. And this is a 50-year articulation yeah. of bad habits. So I tell, I tell all my friends who are, you know, want to make the Portland police okay. better, want to get involved, I tell them to buy this book and they read it, yep. because that will help them understand a lot of things that are really pissing off today, but it should be an issue. With that, it should be an issue in the department. Even with that, as, as, I must as, read. as we're trying to, to make changes with our police department so Something. that they're better public servants, we can't handcuff them when it comes to taking on um, violent, well, wait a minute, murderous but wait a minute. individuals. But wait, but wait a minute, you're the public. You're responsible for giving them the guidelines well, to operate. Well, them. hold it. No, I'm, wait a minute. You are the public. You are the one that's responsible. Well, to give them the guidelines. Well, you see, I.e., through your mail. I'm very boisterous, <laughs> but I'm still a black guy, so my voice only goes so far. But you, hey, but you, you understand? You're a private no, citizen. We need more white people, okay, asking questions of the people we vote for. There you go. They, okay, I tell my I'm friends, start it off with asking questions. That'll help you lead you to where you need to go. Start asking okay. questions. Mm -hmm. The first one is, what are you going to do 
to lower the violence in my community because I tell a lot of my white who friends. Who are you talking to now? I'm talking to everybody. No, no, no. I'm talking about you going to ask who. The ask person who the represents people us. you vote for. There you go. You ask the people running for mayor, people running for city council, but it's not just that. I'd ask Chip Shields, I'd ask who's never done anything to protect us, never done anything to protect us from the violence, ever. Um, I'd ask Lou Frederick, I'd ask Anybody who wants to be what in about politics. the mayor of the city? Because no, I'd ask Charlie Hills. No, I'd ask Charlie, Charlie, and the commissioners. What can, are you going to do to protect us? Because right. I, well, this is what I don't want to see, and I tell my white friends this all all the time. I said, if one of these gang members murders your son or daughter, are you racist for wanting that black person held accountable? You understand? And, and it's coming unless you've got your kid locked down in their room or their basement or their mm -hmm. garage. Yeah. You understand where you can protect them, you know, from all the bad things. They're probably going to be out in one of our streets, one of our parks, maybe even one of our high schools, maybe one of our colleges, living their life, doing what they need to do. And a stray bullet or something is going to end them. This kid in, um, on Alberta Street is a warning to all of us. Yeah. Thank God he only shot three people. And even the three people he shot were by accident. But there was about 500 people in range of that weapon. Yeah. There was about 500, and, and, and don't take this wrong, probably 95% of them weren't black. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So about 500 people, 475 people that weren't, are not in gangs, uh, aren't black, aren't anything. And, and most of the black people on that street, by the way, were, are not in gangs. But we're used to being, you know, having guns pointed at us. <laughs> <Okay>? <laughs> What if one of those nice hipster people or young kids, Get young shot. children, had gotten shot and killed? Now, if a white person is saying, hey, they killed my son, they killed my daughter, they killed my wife, they killed my, my, bro my brother, are they racist for saying, Rod Underhill, please do everything you can to keep this person off the street mm -hmm. to make sure nobody else goes through this? Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm asking people to, to start making an issue of violence in our community. Uh, black gangs, of course, but all violence. Start asking the people you vote for, what are you going to do mm -hmm. to protect us, all of us, me too, you understand, all of us, from violence? Because if we lower violence in general, it will lower the violence in the black community. But we've got to get white people understanding that violence in this town is there for them too? Well, you know, you know, uh, that's saying I, I appreciate what you're saying in regards to that art shooting because there was an article in the Sunday's Oregonian, and you know, the Sunday's Oregonian it, it reaches everybody, mm -hmm. and and the, very responsible people are reading this stuff. They're not in the Northeast Portland corridor. They don't know what's going on. They're looking for answers. Okay. Yeah. But but I, as I looked at that article, the things that you were talking about, where was the police commissioner? <laughs> Where was the mayor? They should have interviewed the mayor and police commissioner. You know, in this case, it happens to be Charlie Hale. But my point is that there were some other little points about, you know, that Antoinette was basically, she was in, in charge of the youth thing. Mm -hmm. But then they put that stamina on again. You know, yeah, I, yeah, but you she see, got to identify with blacks only, as see, far as I'm concerned. Uh, she should have been down at City but Hall. That's, this is a perfect example. She should be down at City Hall. The moment the mayor found out her grandson tried to murder people, on one of our most important streets in this, I mean, all streets are important, yeah, yeah. but this one's important because we got about 10,000 people on it, yeah. okay? He should have let her go. But why? She, she's no longer effective. No, no, but why? Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's his job. No, no, I know it's his job, he but, gives but her she worked for him. Yeah, but I understand, but the bottom line, he pretty well lays out the outline, and the guidelines in terms, this is what you do for the job. That's how she got hired. Uh, I wonder, did she tell him, I mean, because there's no way she did not know her son was involved with gangs before this no, happened. No, 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 no. That, I wonder, grand, did she tell them? No, wait, no, first, that's a grandson. It's not a son. Or a grandson. Well, a no, grandson. her son got out of prison because he was yeah, ganged but, up, but, too. But still, I mean, that, that's, yeah. another, that's another issue. Yeah, but he hired a woman who's got a gang son in prison. No, come on. No, well, now, wait a minute. Wait, Fred. No, yeah, wait, you're wait, right, Fred. No, 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 but I mean, yeah, come on. Are we going to start hiring child molesters to be babysitters? No, but I understand that. But Fred, you know? Fred, but my point is that the, the word is, you know, right, you do the crime, you do the time, you come out, and that's another issue, if you will. You got me? Yeah. But, but his life is ruined. Hold it, hold it. Yeah. There is no reason for anybody to ever trust a black person who's a gang member. Me as a black man, I do not trust a white guy that tells me, you know, Fred, I used to be a member of the Klan. How many black people trust <laughs> former Klan members? Okay, but, but we will trust list, a you, former would, black gang member. But do you have the list? Do you know them? 
Well, you, the police, you know the, that's you, what you, I want the mayor the, to do. I the, want the mayor. I know who I feel are gang members in the community because I grew up here. And a lot of these gangbangers right now out here, I went to high school or served in the military, something with their with their parentage. Okay, okay. You understand that some of these gang members, what about clan their members? grandparents hey, what and about my grandparents were friends. Do, do you know any clan members as you're going out selling clan I've met clan members. What, I've had what, clan what members wanna, try to burn my car up. What do you, what do you, what, what do you <laughs> want to do with them? What, 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 should, what should we do with clan members? Well, when clan members commit violent <laughs> crimes, I mean, and that's why I, I say to my white friends, if a clan member was rolling down Alberta Street okay. and was shooting at all the black folks, okay. what would you want to do? See, that's why clan members don't do it. A clan member knows that if he goes out and shoots up black people in Portland, his life is done. There is no way mm -hmm. white people in Portland would tolerate that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would okay. not go. Okay. That person would not have a happy life for the rest of their life. So what do you say? But to you black can be a black people, gang member but, 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 and shoot and kill you, as many what, black what, people, and you get milk and cookies and love and forgiveness. But what about the response of a black people in their community? In, in, in well, the community? The, the, a lot of black what, people. What do you say to them? What, what do you say to them? What should I they tell do? black people? They need to start standing up and start talking about it. They need to do be like the black people of fifty or sixty years ago. I mean, we. I can't remember every single detail, but I grew up hearing stories about how fast guys would disappear if they got into a knife fight on Williams Avenue back in the 1940s and 50s. You mm -hmm. understand? Mm -hmm. I mean, Cox Funeral Home made money off of knuckleheads. <laughs> you, you understand? The black community back then pr protected their own. They protected their community. And so you get some knucklehead who just came up here off the farm who thinks that because things don't go his way one night on Williams Avenue, he can pull out a knife. Let's just say he regretted it. It didn't happen again. But here in Portland, we get a gangbanger. Oh, my God. It's almost like some people in the black community treat them like they're some sort of celebrity. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I'm saying? And that's not what the black community was like in the 50s, 60s, 70s. I mean, ask, ask, ask Don. He was here. How many black guys went rolling around Alberta Street or any street and just randomly started shooting at black folks? You want to run that thing? <laughs> Well, I didn't. I didn't allow it. For yeah, one thing. exactly. Because in those days, I was the only one that had a gun. Yep. And if you had a gun, I was going to take it away from you. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I hate if I had to chase you up on your porch and take it away from you. Yeah. I took it away from you. Mm -hmm. Now you said a minute ago, if you stick a microphone uh, into this kid's face, he's he, that's. They're talking about, oh, now I'm being profiled. Mm -hmm. I'm being racially profiled. Correct. Well, you know that still irritates me too because the word profiling is getting a bad. Uh, a bad reputation because as a policeman as a policeman if I work in Killingsworth to Alberta 15th to the river that's my district now if you drive through my district and I don't know who you are I'm going to stop you mm -hmm. because it's my job to see who you are mm -hmm. what you're driving are you wanted do you have any drugs in the car but it would be just blacks just driving or? no anybody that comes through the district that I don't know okay Okay. White, black, or whatever. That's my job. And so is that profiling or is it good police work? Somewhere in the middle is the oh, truth. Yeah. Now, now, now if you got if you got if you got a black professor like one that I know that lives in Beaverton and he gets stopped the first time, okay, now we know who the black guy driving the Cadillac is that lives in Beaverton. The second or third or fourth time, that's bullshit profiling. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's bullshit that's profiling. That's harassment. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Well, you know, uh, you make you make a good point because we're so into this this this, this divide the yeah. divide routine that any black for that minute, like you said, just going in for the first time, you want to know who that person that's is, right. whether you have a tie on or not, right? <coughs> anyway, mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that it's the way it is, but hopefully we can get down to the point that the person can drive the community like anything else. But at the same time, you should still be able to do your police work. Fair? And Bruce, this yeah. is something that these bad black families are doing to Portland. Portland's a, a clean, good city to live in. We're really not a violent city by nature. We've got a fraction of our population, as far as the black population, that is like this. They were talking, depending on who you talk to, between 250 and 400 people. That's not a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They're so small, you would expect the Portland police could have easily managed So what, what do we do with but these what, folks? What do we do with What I'm folks? getting to is, because they're so violent, you can't blame a, a cop for being on edge if he sees somebody who's acting like he's a gang member, who is associating with a gang member. Mm -hmm. You cannot tell a cop to ignore what is a known threat. And we know every black gang member is a threat to every black person in Portland. And now, 
every white person in Portland. Well, white gang members too. Well, no, white gang you know, members so far up to this point, they just don't murder people like black gang members do. They, I mean, they do their thing, and I am not saying they're 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 they're, they're choir boys, but the Jesse Jokers have been on my on on MLK at least. 40 years that I know of, probably closer to 50. I've never heard of the Gypsy Jokers opening their door and just shooting folks. You know, well, I, I go, well, should, well, should when a Gypsy should, Joker drives by well, me, well, I'm not even worried about well, it. Well, let me ask you a question. <laughs> should we allow gang members at all? Yeah, you can't tell people they can't associate. Okay, so is it No, okay, so, well, you okay. can't do that. It's the violence. Let's ask, let's ask Don. What do you mm-hmm. think about that, Don? Well, you, you're right, Fred. You can't you can't say you can't do this, you can't do that. Okay. What you got to do is enforce what they did wrong. Mm-hmm. It's always been against the law to use a gun under crime. Mm-hmm. Enforce that. Mm-hmm. Enforce that. And again, you know, if 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 I don't check this person out, then I'm not doing my job. I'm mm-hmm. not protecting you. Mm-hmm. If I let this bullshit go on, mm-hmm. if I let him drive by and I know he's a gang member, mm-hmm. or I know I might have a warrant, mm-hmm. or he's probably got a gun. I, I got to find that out mm-hmm. to protect you mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. and me. Okay. That's my job. And, Is and that the profiling? St- the state of the state of Oregon, the state of Oregon should have a DNR uh, autom- automatic DNR notice for every known gang member. Well, they do, do not resuscitate. Don't they carry a list down at the Portland right now? Huh? They carry a list of they people carry a list of, <laughs> of people they, they, across they, the board. They ca- they carry a list of people that they know are gang members, and they ter- carry a list well, so what's of the people defini- that they know so associate how, with so gang members. So what's the definition of a gang member? I'm gonna ask both of you guys. Let mm-hmm. me ask Don Free. What is the definition of a That's gang? A <laughs> How, how, does, how does one define? How it's does he official, get on the list? It's an official or unofficial association with people, uh, for whatever purpose, for uh, for a criminal activity or for good activity. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's a crim- It's an association uh, based on your interests and your desires. Interests and desires. Not, mm-hmm. what I mean, they have, they have committed a crime. Yeah. Or, no. They, yeah. No. We, no. They, they, they didn't talk about I don't know if they committed a crime or not. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't know that. But if I, you, you know, you can't tell me I can't belong to the moose or right. the elks. Right. I mean, whatever. Correct. But right. if I if I go out and shoot a moose or an elk, yeah. then I'm in trouble. Okay, okay, okay. Then, okay. I, then I'm a gang member. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. okay, yeah. okay. And okay. that's and that's what I'm saying. You know, no, so I wouldn't have any problem way. with black gangs in Portland if they weren't murdering people. Exactly. You know, I mean, that's what I tell people. People always that, that I catch defending black gangs. So do you understand? You're 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 defending people who murder people, who rape, and are involved in sex trafficking. Wow. Are all gang members that way? Uh, most of the black gangs when are, you say are most, all What those. percentage are you talking about? Nearly all of the 250 to 400, depending on who you talk to. They all, That's what they all, do. They've all been raping and... Raping killing. and trying to murder. They they try to murder and they murder. Okay. And they rape. No. And they no, sell women. No, no. Now, let's talk about, let's talk about uh, IE, who's responsible, if you will, for setting up the guidelines for the police, the person that's doing his job. It has to be the mayor. And it has to be to the people, the people like us who we elect, right? They're elected, right? We elect the mayor, and the mayor is responsible. If you don't like the police department, fire the mayor. Correct. Okay, right. Hold him responsible. Right. Make me the mayor, I'll fix it. That's right, that's right. You know, because it would be my responsibility. Mm -hmm. I'll fix it. I know how to fix it. Mm -hmm. You know how to fix it. You know how to fix it. Yep. Let's fix it. And I've heard two mayors say that. Two former mayors have, I've heard them literally say, the police department was their responsibility. And the fights that they had with the police, and they had many, that's just how the nature is. If you, mm-hmm. you're going to fight with the police, you're going to go to court, but you need a mayor that's willing to do that for the public good. Mm-hmm. And I tell people, God knows what the city would be like if we didn't have mayors over the last, let's say, 30 years that were willing to take on that fight. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not going to be easy. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes uh, the current mayor... Um, just doesn't want the headache, you know. Just just yeah, doesn't want people the are headache. dying. Though. It's just buying people. But they're black people yeah. dying, yeah. Yeah. and he doesn't have white people calling him no, up, no, no, screaming at him no, about he, black he has, people no, dying. In all due respect, he has a divide between white and black. People are concerned about that stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. when they see another, maybe a person going to, to applying for a job or something like that, and, and all of a sudden it's a black skinned person. Guess what? He loses the job. Yeah. It's a, it, we got some heavy time. Mm-hmm. Someone has to take on the responsibility. Well, now, let me ask you another question. As far as the guidelines are concerned, do the police create their own guidelines? Never. Into, Never. Huh? Never. It's called general orders. But, but the perception but the perception is if the police is running the city. Well, what's that all about, Don? Well, that's the truth. That is the truth. That's the truth. Wow. You know. How do we get there? They got there by union power. 
union power. Union power and the illegal, that's the other thing, is as long as we let the police violate the Constitution, mm -hmm. it's not going to change because our cops are violating the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And they've got it in the union contract that wow. it's okay, the 14th Amendment doesn't count. Wow. If we have a police department that continually violates the law, how how can they be expected, how can we be expected to, to uh, support them? Wow. And that that's what needs to change, and I haven't found anybody yet, Mayor Hales included, that wants to take that on. Wow. It can be incredibly distracting. Incredibly distracting. Unless somebody likes a very big yeah. fight. It's I mean, well, is this going to be a big be one? It be a big fight. You're changing the general orders for the Portland Police Department at the contract level. Yeah, yeah that, that's going to be a fight. Fred, how do you get something in a contract that's against the law? It's, it's, it's not against the law. The way it's written in their contract, <laughs> it's not against the law until they've actually broken it, and then you've got this thing called due process, which takes forever. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. that's why it's such a no, distraction. No, the, the way it gets into the law is that the mayor and the, and the, and the city council sign off on it. You, know, yeah. you understand what I'm saying? They still yeah. sign off. Somebody has to sign off for that contract. They Somebody. can't just do it themselves, well, can they or can't they? You know, what the mayor doesn't understand, and this is what I would do, I don't need to pass a big law or, or cause a big problem to get rid of internal affairs. Okay. I'm the chief of police. I'm the mayor. I'm going to transfer you out. I'm going to transfer you out, you, you out, and you out, and you out. Pretty soon there's nobody left in internal mm -hmm. affairs. Okay. Now you work in the street. Mm -hmm. You simply gut them by transferring them out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't exist anymore. Now who mm -hmm. investigates the cops if there's no the internal affairs? The district attorney. If they, if they break the law... I like that. If they break the law, they go before the same system that you mm -hmm. and I do. See, mm -hmm. There's no special system. Mm -hmm. I like that. No, mm -hmm. I, I, I like that. I, mm -hmm. I think that I feel the attorney, I think it's even further. I think the attorney general of Oregon should investigate every shooting of any law enforcement officer inside yeah. the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. It should automatically go to the attorney general. I, I don't feel that cops can investigate cops. Absolutely not. I don't think so. Just like I don't think gang members can investigate gang members. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But you know, with no due respect, it, when it gets down to the bottom line, it's about the eats. Right. And yeah. the, fact of, the fact of the matter is, yeah. look, no one wants to be, hey, don't mess with my money, okay? I mean, I realize I don't like the idea, but I'm getting my check. Yeah. I'm getting my check. I'm getting a good check. Mm -hmm. I can even do outside work. I can get this. I can do this. I mean, if I shoot somebody, I can get a, I can get a week off to Hawaii for a while when I'm sitting around doing this, that, and that. For I'm concerned, it should be back on the damn job. It Transfer should be back out. on the job. But the Transfer bottom line out. is that we got to get some control here. And, and again, it gets right back to leadership. We, Fred, we elect those folks. Well, not just we. Everybody is watching your show. That's what I'm saying. We That's elect why I those keep folks. telling I say, all my friends, and I say this to my white friends especially because yes. they, they outnumber us. Yes. I said, we're not going to see a change until white people are asking questions. <clears throat> Don't feel like in the very well, beginning well, of, the, of, of, the, of, the, of, of all these races that you're about to see <laughs> that you need to know all the answers. Start the whole process by seeing if the people that want your vote have answers. Mm -hmm. Most people, black and white, are reasonable. You know, you can tell when you're being BS'd. Give yeah. yourself an opportunity to hear what these guys are going to say and run it by your your BS meter. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Do I feel this person's mm -hmm. really going to try to protect me? I mean, we got a lot of people on city council. I bet everybody, I bet not one person in city council has been in a serious fight since Howdy Doody was on television. <laughs> I mean, these guys don't even... Who, who's Howdy These Doody? guys wouldn't even protect... What, wait a minute, who is Howdy Doody? Howdy Doody was a TV show back in the 1950s. Oh, okay, okay. I mean, these guys, they didn't join the military, they didn't get in fights in high school, they definitely didn't fight in college. They don't know how to fight. We need people to motivate them to learn how to fight for the people that they represent. They're, they are, are supposed to protect us, just like our president. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they don't. I mean, everybody who was at last Thursday, last month, who was in harm's way, and if you were there, you were in harm's way. About the shooting. That, that shooting. The shooting. Because yeah. nine millimeters, I don't know if you know this, that, that shooting happened on 20th. That thing is the effective kill range of up to uh, one direction, 18th, the other direction, 22nd. So wow. if you're between 18th and 22nd, wow. that 16-year-old could have murdered you. If you had a child or somebody you care about in that range when those rounds went off, you, yeah. They could have been killed. You understand? You should. People who love Northeast Portland, people who love Portland, should be so hopping mad right now that the mayor and everybody on city council, and more importantly, everybody's getting ready to run for office and ask That's you for your point. vote. Very important. Okay, do something.
Mm -hmm. because we got lucky. We got blessed. Mm -hmm. And even with that, the three guys that got shot, they weren't even the intended victims. Yeah, they weren't even the intended victims. They were shot by accident. They were friends of the shooter. (laughs) Shows you how dumb these gangbangers are, you know? But the thing is, that ignorance, that ignorance could have put innocent people, people that we all love, people we all care about, people who aren't violent, yeah. people who are just enjoying their lives, okay, could have put them in the ground. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, let me ask you a question. You know, we, we were talking about this uh, the, the last show a little bit. As a detective, okay, you, you get on the scene, and now all of a sudden you're investigating this. You, you made the point about, well, where did the gun come from? Yeah. <laughs> That's the first. Where did the gun come from? Where did from? the gun come yeah. from? How did he get the gun? Maybe he got it from his dad. That's what I want to know. Yeah. Is his dad's gun? Did he get from his mother? Yeah. Did he buy it on the street? Where did he get the gun? Or his uncle? I mean, gee whiz. Yeah. Oh, he, did he? Or did he get it in a in a burglary or, or something of that nature? Yeah, and yeah. and the person didn't have a safe to lock it. But, <laughs> but people, it's all supposed to be locked up, right? But you know, people right? also got to look at it this way. We got a lot of troubled sixteen-year-old people, of all colors, yeah. that do not get a gun, and shoot at people because they looked at them funny. You know, you know. So this guy is a special individual. It's called special badness. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, a lot of times it's peer pressure. Well, well, he, the dude's yeah, hey, peer pressure. I had peer pressure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Guess what? I didn't go uh, murdering uh, people uh, at sixteen well, you years had to join old. The, you had to join the Marine Corps. Well, what, what I'm getting to is this: <laughs> what we got to what we got to look out for is how long this kid's going to be in prison. I'm hoping to God that Rod Underhill goes to, for the max. You talking about the DA, right? The DA. I hope he's trying to put this boy in prison for thirty-five to forty years. Because this kid's going to be a threat to society till statistically, till he's till he's 50 years old. He's already shown us he has got a willingness to murder people, mm-hmm. and he doesn't care about whom or how many he puts at risk. And mm-hmm. people, if you think race relations are going to suck are oh, sucking right now, well, it's, it's, wait until one of these no. gangbangers kills a white person, especially a white person that has nothing to do. Yeah. with gangs or anything, just living their life, maybe just enjoying one of our coffees or one of our beers, we're going to have a white person, an innocent white person, murdered by a gang member, and, you know, people are going to be offended that that family is going to want justice. Well, in all, due, <laughs> in, in all due respect, not just to particularly naming a person, in all due respect, Charlie Hill could have been out there, out there basically just milling around the crowd. Well, I heard he was show. on the street when it happened. Yeah. I don't know if it's true or not. Yeah, and, and, that, and had that happened to him, then all of a sudden, you know, guess what? Hey, what would happen with race relations if a black gang member murdered Charlie Hills or Nancy Hills? Oh, gee. I mean, by accident. I'm yeah, not saying yeah, that they're trying yeah, to. Yeah. Let's say Nancy's out doing the first lady duties and is representing the city very well, and some black gangbanger sees somebody who didn't, you know, he didn't like, and he shoots and misses, and a bullet you know, takes out Nancy Hales. People is it of... racist for the mayor of Portland and the white power establishment yeah. to want that black gang member held accountable? No, mm. no I don't think it's racist, no, but no, you know what's going to happen? <clears throat> That's what people are going to say. They're going to go, well, because he's black, you're going to be harder on him. You, you mm. understand? I mean, guys, we got to fix this problem before we really have a problem. Right now, it's just a major annoyance. But this thing is about ready to blow up in this town. But then, you know, another point that I'm, I'm going to throw it out on the table here. You know, media, social media has a lot to do with this stuff. I'm talking, I'm talking, I'm talking yeah. about the Argonian, the Willamette Week, the, the Tribune. You got the, a lot of these young reporters. You got reporters for that matter. Yeah. They have no background whatsoever. And again, they eat. It's about eating. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got to make sure I satisfy my responsibility aspect yeah. of it. I can't mention any names. I can't do this, that, and the other. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to get that. Was it that that people surprise that normally get you get the hundred thousand dollars or something of this nature? So I. They, I I mean, I just got to keep the keep fueling the fire. Let's, let's yeah. just keep fueling the fire. What do you think about that? Come on, Don. What well, do you think? That's, that, that's right. You know, uh, there's a responsibility. N- n- there. News is made by by violence. Okay. News is made by violence. Somebody gets shot. The reporters are out there. You know, this is what we do. It'll be on the six o'clock news. Mm-hmm. They get paid. It's it's the deal. I I think it was a newspaper that I heard. The young man being quoted as, he saw the fella giving him the evil eye. Yeah. Now, if Jesus. he's, he's look, if I got a gun, he, he has a gun, and he's he's going up Alberta Street looking for somebody that's giving him the evil eye. He's looking to kill somebody, yeah. Fred. He's looking to kill somebody. Correct. That's why he went out there with that gun. That's why he went he's out looking there. At, he's looking to kill somebody. That's why he went out there. Wow. Where was his dad? Where was his mom? Where did he get the damn gun? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, no. mm-hmm. Well, my point is that why didn't, and Maxine is a very senior reporter. Yeah. Why didn't she 
bring out these points. Yeah. So those are the questions that she her, should have been her, asked. Her editors are white people who don't fight either. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so they're not. Go, they're they're. I got a feeling that not Max, picking on her particularly. No, I'm not picking on her at all. I think she's. A, I think a she's a great reporter. Oh, she's a but let's reporter. be honest. But the Oregonian's her. editorial staff has never been very aggressive about dealing with the black gang problem or the violent problem yeah. in Portland. <laughs> they never have. They are more likely to write a story about some black gang member who wants parole now that he's found Jesus. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've got in prison for killing a couple of black folks. I found the Lord. So let me out so I can mentor other black kids. Well, Jesus. I, I'm going to put you on this spot. <laughs> I'm going to put you on this spot. What about the black newspapers who basically are looked at from the standpoint of nobody reads, talking about nobody these reads issues. black newspapers? Well, you got the scanner, you no, got the observer. Nobody reads either those. Nobody reads either <laughs> one of those papers. Period. Well, why are they? Why are they identified as it? I mean, white people are looking at it from the standpoint of saying, "Can you, I'm going to read that paper so I can get a, get a feel of how and why they think." I have way. never had a white person ever ask me, "Have you seen that latest article in either one of those papers?" Yeah, you're right. I'm 50 years old. Scanner the Observer. I've never seen anybody share a story. Even their writers. I got some of their writers on my Facebook page. They don't share their own stories on Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't, the white the black newspapers. Um, have absolutely no influence in the st in the city of Portland right now. Well, okay, let me ask you another question. What about the black elected officials? You've got county commissioners. You've got uh, you got legislators. You mentioned several of them. A couple of them. You got Lou. You got uh, Loretta and whatever. I mean, I'm hoping uh, they change. They haven't done very much. Loretta. Uh, I mean, I like Loretta and I like Lou. They haven't done very much to protect us from black gang violence. Wow, wow. Nothing. Wow. Well, guys, hey, look, we're, we're about a minute out right here at this point in time. This has been great. You got, we got to come back on. Look like sure. we got some other things. That hopefully we'll get some response. So what, the next time we'll do this piece, we're going to open up the line right up front and see if we can get folks to, 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 get, to give yeah. us a call and talk about the issues because that's what it's all about. Yeah. So, folks, we want to thank you very much for being with us. I think it's very, very important that we discuss this issue very seriously if we're going to go forward. And I'm talking about all of us, all of you, all of you, we have to get to the table and talk. Find out where your kids are. What are they doing? Understand what's going on. we got a problem here. It's not just the kids. Right? It's the family's problem. Okay? Let's do that. Okay, that's it. Take care, folks. Have a good one. I'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.